I'm truly sorry, Mr. Walker. I hate giving guys like you bad news, John Michaels said, as he handed me an envelope containing a full written account of my wife's activities with her former boss, Grant Jacobs. The envelope also contained several photographs and a DVD. I've already seen the photos, but haven't watched the DVD yet. Part of me didn't want to look at him, but I knew it would be necessary so that I could deal with what John had found. Do you have any idea how long this has been going on? I asked. John reviewed his initial report before responding. From what we could determine from the transcripts, at least 10 years, John said. Possibly up to 12 years old. It seems this started around the time your wife was being considered for the top job. This was about a year after our daughter Sophie was born. Still, I decided that I would need to do a DNA test to find out if the children were mine. Then I thought of something else. What about sexually transmitted diseases? The report revealed that Grant, in addition to Linda, has several other married women with whom he has sex. How could she infect me during all this time? I need to get tested and as soon as possible. Looking at the report again, I laughed humorously at John's conclusion that Linda seemed blissfully unaware of what the asshole was doing when he wasn't having sex with her. If it's any consolation, Mr. Walker, your wife's lover has stated that he never had any intention of ruining your marriage. All he wanted was her body, John said, and they never did anything in your house. I let John outfit our house with cameras and microphones when I first hired him. At least my marital bed was not disturbed by Grant's bodily fluids, I thought. No, that's no consolation, Mr. Michaels, I said, but thank you for telling me about it. I met Grant Jacobs a few times and didn't like him too much. He was what women would call handsome, but he was also a smug, arrogant, arrogant asshole with a smirk that drove me crazy. More than once I had to fight the urge to wipe that grin right off his face. Now I know the real reason for his grin. That's not all, Mr. Walker, John said. From what we've seen and heard, Jacobs's sister Natalie was aware of their relationship from the very beginning. In fact, it looks like she may have been helping them. This saddened me somewhat since I had always thought Natalie was a sweet woman, the complete opposite of her brother. Damn, I said softly. So, have you already talked to the lawyer? Asked John. Not yet. I said. I wanted to find out the truth first. Well, I work a lot for Lisa Hawkins. She is the best in the business, in my opinion. She hates scammers with a passion. If you want, I can forward this to her office and let her know that you are coming to see her, John said. That would be nice, I said. Thank you. I'll call her office and make an appointment. John gave me a business card and I put it in my pocket. May I make a suggestion? Asked John. Of course, I said. Let Lisa take care of it. I understand that you are hurting right now and may be tempted to lash out at her. No need. It's not worth going to jail over. This is not some story on the internet. This is real life. You have two children to think about, he said. I understand, I said. Thank you. I paid the bill and left his office feeling like my entire married life had been a lie. I knew John was right, but it still hurt like hell. I sat in the car and cried for about 15 minutes. Collecting my thoughts, I took out the card he had given me, called Lisa Hawkins Law Office and made an appointment for the next day. Lisa gave me a list of things to bring. First of all, financial statements. On the way home, I stopped at the store and bought a pack of cigarettes, something I hadn't done since college. Then I went to the bar and tried to drown my sorrows in beer. I'm not much of a drinker, but this time I felt like I deserved it. Are you okay, buddy? Asked the bartender as I took a drag from my cigarette. I looked up at him before answering. Is it really that obvious? I asked in response. I'm afraid so, he said with a slight smile. Don't tell me, let me guess. You just found out that your wife is cheating on you. Yes, practically, I said. The last twelve years, if you can believe it. I can believe it, he said. I've seen and heard almost everything since I started working here. You bet, I said. He chuckled at this. Do you mind if I tell you something my grandfather once told me? He asked. Go ahead, I said. 
he said, I felt sorry for myself because I didn't have shoes. Then I met a guy who didn't have feet. I know you're hurting right now. I've been there myself. But it gets better. And believe me, there are a lot of guys who had it much worse than you, he said. Your grandfather seems to have been a very wise man, I said. So it was, said the bartender. Finish your beer and go home, son. Get busy. Do what you have to do. You won't find any answers at the bottom of this glass. Trust me. I smiled at this and nodded my head. I knew deep down that this old bartender was right. While sipping my beer, I thought about many things. I would never have believed that Linda would actually cheat on me. Over the years, there have been little things that in and of themselves could not be considered absolute proof of betrayal. But when I put it all together, it all made sense, at least to me. For example, after the birth of our second child, Sophie, I had a vasectomy. Linda started taking birth control again, and I thought it was strange, so I asked her about it. After all, why would she need birth control if I had a vasectomy? She told me a story about being very careful and said that the pills would help regulate my periods. Not being an expert in such matters, I bought her explanation. Then, when she got the job and started traveling with Grant, I noted that some of her clothes weren't exactly what you'd call business attire. She indicated that entertainment would likely be a big part of her new job when I asked her about it. Now I knew that it was Grant who was entertaining her. Apparently this was an important part of her new position, so to speak. I often called to talk to her in the evenings when she was not at home. I was amazed that she was always in her room when I called, but several times I thought I heard a man's voice nearby. On other occasions I heard Linda's voice crack as she spoke. I couldn't explain it then. But if at that moment, while she was talking to me on the phone, she was having sex with Grant, that, of course, would explain everything. There were also times when I could smell Grant's aftershave on Linda's clothes when she came home. I knew it was his scent because I smelled it every time I met him and it almost made me sick. This could only happen if she was in close contact with him. Then there were the Friday afternoons when she was supposedly asked to work after she retired. My specialized skills are still needed, so my services have been retained for one day a week. Although sometimes I will have to travel, she told me when I asked her about it. It's just business, she added. Now I know her special skills included having sex with her boss, and it was much more than just business. And if that wasn't enough, one day a week turned into two, sometimes three days, and she usually didn't get home until 9 or 10 p.m., and her occasional trips turned from one a month to two or three, and almost always included an entire weekend. So much for your pension. All this has happened in just the last four months. The fact is that Linda's attitude towards me has not changed at all. She was just as sweet and loving to me as she was when we first got married. She seemed to enjoy being home with the kids and me, and we enjoyed having her at home. It was a welcome change as I became the children's primary caregiver due to her crazy schedule. This bothered me for quite some time, so I hired John's investigative firm to look into its activities. And now, my worst fears were confirmed. The only question that now remains to be answered is how to divide everything. If it was just a drunken one-off, I probably could have gotten over it. Yes, I would be angry, but it wouldn't be a deciding factor. However, it was a cold, calculating, and deliberate betrayal that lasted more than ten years. And now, it's time to pay someone. I put out my cigarette, finished my beer, and walked out, waving to the bartender and giving him a good tip for his time. When I returned home, I saw her car in the garage. To be honest, I was a little surprised to see her there. I closed the garage door and went inside. I took off my jacket and headed to my home office. Linda intercepted me on the way and immediately smelled cigarettes and beer. You smoked, she said, frowning, and I smell beer. Is everything okay, John? No. To be honest, no. In fact, today was the worst day of my life, I said. What's happened? Did someone die or something? She asked. She seemed genuinely concerned, but I wondered if she was just pretending. Something, I said. I'm going to my office for the evening. 
I'm afraid I won't have very good company today. Is there anything I can do, honey? She asked. Yes, I thought. Get off it. I'm afraid there's nothing you can do, I said. By the way, John, I'm going away for the weekend starting Friday, she said. It was only Tuesday, and she's telling me she's going away for the weekend. Again. What? Again? Didn't you just go away for the weekend? I asked. Yes, but I'm afraid something has happened, she said. It's just business, you know. You bet, I said sarcastically. What about Sophie's birthday? It's this Saturday. I know, she said, but this simply cannot be avoided. Please explain to her why I can't be there. Please. No, I answered. I won't cover for you anymore. You missed Aaron's birthday last year and our anniversary? You can tell our daughter why you prefer to be on the trip with Grant rather than celebrate her birthday here. Linda was not too happy about this and sighed heavily before answering. John, please, you're being unreasonable, she said. No, Linda, I said. You supposedly retired a few months ago after your company was sold. But you've been gone so much that I can't help but wonder what's really going on. Maybe you want to tell me something. What do you want to say? Are you accusing me of having an affair? She asked defensively. What would you think if the situation were reversed? I asked. After that, she backed down a little. I understand you, she said. But believe me, it's just business. That's what you said, I told her. Now if you'll excuse me, I have something to do. Please don't detain me. Tonight you'll have to look after the children. I went into my home office closed and locked the door. I heard Linda trying to open the door. John? She asked. Please, John, talk to me. Leave it, me. One, Linda, I said through clenched teeth. I'm busy. I heard her leave and began gathering all the information Lisa said she would need. I then turned to the evidence John provided. I read the report and found it hard to believe that this was the woman I had loved and supported for the past 12 years. Then I put on my headphones and started the DVD. Unless you have been in my shoes and been there, you simply cannot understand the full range of emotions when the woman you love more than anything in the world willingly gives herself to another man. I didn't know how John got the videos, and I didn't care. All I knew was that all the love I once felt for Linda was now gone. As I watched her have sex with Grant in his bed, I swore I'd never touch her again. I took the time to listen to their pillow talk. Still valid this weekend? Grant asked, hugging her. Of course, Linda answered with a smile. You know, I can't go long without sex with you. What about your daughter's birthday? It's this weekend, isn't it? He asked. Yes, but John will be there, she said. He copes much better with children than I do. Besides, if I had a choice between running around with a bunch of cranky kids or being here with you, I'd choose to be with you. You know I like having you here, Linda. But I'm worried he might get suspicious, Grant said. In the end, you should be retired. I already told you, Grant. Retired or not, I'm going to continue having sex with you. Yes, I love my family and I love John. But I would never give up sex with you, she said. You are now a part of my life, and what we have shared for the last 12 years means more to me than you will ever know. I'm glad to hear that from you, Grant said. Remember, when we first started, you said that if you had a choice, you would have stayed with John and the children. Do you still think so? Honestly, I don't know, she said. This was never brought up. I don't know how you managed to keep him in the dark all these years, Grant said. You know, if he ever figures it out, he'll be in for hell. It wasn't easy at first, but I learned to separate my business life from my home life, she said. I never refused him anything and always tried to treat him right. I'm not worried about him finding out. If he finds out, I will simply threaten to rape him in the divorce. I don't think it will be that easy, Grant said. But if something happens, you can stay here if you want. I like it when you're around. Thank you, Grant. I appreciate it but nothing will happen. He hasn't figured it out in 12 years, and I don't think he ever will. How long do you intend to continue in the same spirit? 
as long as possible, for the rest of my life, if I can, she said. You just might make your wish come true, I thought as I turned off the video. I pulled out the DVD and put it back in my briefcase. I heard Linda knock on the office door. What? I asked. The children go to bed? She said. Maybe you could at least go out and say goodnight to them. Yes, just for a minute, I said. I turned off the computer and went upstairs, ignoring Linda. I tried to put on a happy face as I put the kids to bed. Sophie looked at me cheerfully. Are you okay, Dad? She asked. Yes, I answered, smiling at her. I'm fine. Go to bed, honey. I love you. I love you too, she said, kissing me. I left her room, went downstairs, and grabbed a cup of coffee. I warmed up dinner for you, John, Linda said. I'm not hungry, I said, going outside. I sat down on one of the lounge chairs on the back patio and lit a cigarette. Linda came out a couple of minutes later. She tried to kiss me, but I turned my head and she kissed me on the cheek. I did not want for anything in the world to touch the lips with which she caressed Grant Jacobs. She looked at me, shocked. Talk to me, John, please. What's bothering you? She asked with a worried expression on her face. I've never seen you like this, and you know that I don't like it when you smoke. You haven't smoked since college. Yes, but we don't always get what we want, do we? I asked. And what does it mean? She asked. I shook my head and said nothing. John, please talk to me. I love you. You know you can tell me everything. I looked at her through the clouds of smoke and shook my head. I'm afraid it's too late for that, I said. Too late for what? I don't understand, she said. You are a smart businesswoman, I said. You will understand everything. Now please leave me alone. I need to figure something out. But maybe I can help if you just tell me what's going on, she begged. Linda, please, for the last time, just leave it. Me. One, I said, anger evident in my voice. I realized that my attitude might give everything away now, so I toned down my tone a little. Sorry it's so short. This job is very bad and it gets me, maybe in a couple of days. I didn't like lying to her, but I thought, what the hell? It's okay to lie to a liar, isn't it? Okay, she said quietly. She stepped away from me, tears streaming down her face. She then turned and disappeared into the house. I smoked two more cigarettes and went into the house. I took a shower to wash away the smell of cigarettes, put on pajamas that I rarely used, and climbed into bed. Linda was lying on her side and, crawling under the blanket, turned to me. She reached for my manhood, but I waved her hand away. This was the first time in our entire marriage that I had turned down her request for sex. John, she began. I turned my back to her, not bothering to kiss her goodnight. Good night, Linda, I said. She turned away, sobbing. At this moment, I didn't care. She could have gone straight to hell because I didn't care. I woke up the next day, showered, got dressed, and packed my things for work. I spent time with the children until they left for school, and then I left the house without so much as a glance at Linda. She looked at me cheerfully as I headed towards the door. Will I never get a kiss from you again? She asked when I opened the door. Sorry, I said, kissing her. I love you, she said. Yes, me too, I said, walking out the door. I made it to the office and was able to get some work done, but it wasn't easy. I told my boss what was going on and he seemed to understand, since he had recently gone through a divorce himself. Do what you have to do, he said. If you need a vacation, let me know. I thanked him and went back to work, leaving early to meet Lisa. Good afternoon, Mr. Walker, she said as I entered her office. Lisa Hawkins was about my age, about 30 with long blonde hair cascading over her shoulders. I saw the rings on her fingers and decided that she was married. Please, Mrs. Hawkins, call me John, I said, shaking her hand. And you can call me Lisa, she said. I read the report that Mr. Michaels sent me. I'm sorry this happened to you. I see things like this often, but they never stop bothering me. How are you holding up? Not very well, I'm afraid, I said. I can understand that, she said. Have you told her anything yet? Not yet, but last night. I was pretty short with her, I said. I suggest you try to be a little more polite with her. 
I know it will be difficult, given what you have learned, but you don't have to show what you know. At least not yet. Let her continue to live as if nothing has changed. She will receive her wake-up call when she is being serviced. You can do it? You're right. It will be difficult. Very difficult, I said. But I will do my best. Okay, said Lisa. Now what do you want to get out of this divorce? As many as I can get, I said. I definitely want custody of the children, as long as they are truly mine. You know that usually the mother ends up with custody, right? She asked. I have been their primary caregiver for the past ten years, I said. And you heard her say on the video that I'm a much better parent than she is. I would have thought that the fact that she chooses to be with her lover rather than her daughter on her birthday would mean something. It is, and we can use it, said Lisa. She reviewed the financial information I had brought with me, making notes as she read. It looks like your wife received a good income from the sale of the company for which she worked. The dividends she receives every month seem to be equal to your salary. This will certainly be in our favor. So there will be no alimony? I asked. Or very little, said Lisa. She's still relatively young, so there's no reason why she can't work. In fact, if we can get custody of you, we can get child support from her. What about the house? I asked. If we can get custody of you, you can stay in the house and we can ask her to pay half the mortgage. Of course, there is a chance that the court will give her custody, in which case you will have to pay half the mortgage, plus child support, she said. The only other option would be to sell the house, and you both would split the proceeds. What about our pension and bank accounts? I asked. We can sweeten the deal by taking retirement accounts out of the equation. Each of you will keep your 401k. The rest, we will divide it 50-50. In any case, that's what the judge will do, she said. What about Grant Jacobs? Can I sue him for alienation of affection? I asked. Not in this state, she said. But we will definitely name him during the divorce. It would be possible to sue for intentional infliction of emotional distress, but I honestly don't think that would go very far, at least not in this state. And his sister, Natalie? She knew this all along. Perhaps she even contributed to this, I said. It's almost the same with her. We can sue if you want, Lisa said. Yes, please. When will you be able to formalize all this? I asked. I think we can do it by Friday, she said. And what? I would prefer it to be served late on Saturday evening. She'll spend the weekend with Grant, I said. It's clear, a bit of shock and awe. I think we can arrange it, she said, but it will cost a little more if the process server leaves on Saturday. It's normal, I said. Do it. Okay, John, she said. We ended the meeting with a handshake. She gave me the obligatory warning not to do anything stupid before she took my deposit check. I left her office feeling more in control of the situation. When I returned home, I was somewhat surprised to see Linda's car in the garage. I expected her to be in the office since it was Wednesday. I touched the hood of her car. It was a little warm, which meant she had driven it not long ago. I walked inside and immediately smelled something hot. Hi, honey, Linda said, leaving the kitchen. You returned home a little earlier. Everything is fine? Yes, I said. I hope you're in a better mood than yesterday, she said. A little better. I'm taking control of the situation, I said. This is good. Are you ready for dinner today? She asked. I cooked a roast, your favorite dish. I'll eat some, I said. Smells tasty. Did you go to the office today? Yes, for a couple of hours, she said, getting things ready for the weekend. Have you spoken to Sophie? I asked. Yes, she's not too happy, but she's young. She'll get over it, Linda said. Where are the children now? I asked. In their rooms, doing homework, she answered. So are you still going on this trip with Grant? I asked. Yes. I told you it's just business, she said firmly. Just business. When do you plan to retire? I asked her. I'm already retired, she said. 
They just need my special expertise for a while. I really don't know how much longer they will need my help. I think you could come back full time. You're almost there. But I think you just need to do what you think is right, I told her. What does it mean? She asked. With all the hours you put in for them, you could get paid, I said. Why? She asked. I will bring home more when I retire. I put my briefcase in the office, then changed into more casual clothes. I complimented her on the roast. She was always a great cook, and I'll miss that when we part ways. After spending some time with the kids, I went to my office and locked the door. Linda tried to open the door, then knocked when she realized it was locked. I opened the door just enough to see her face on the other side. John? She asked. Will you stay here tonight? I think so. I said, I still have a lot to think about, and I don't feel very good. I don't want to risk you getting sick right before the trip, so I'll sleep here on the futon tonight. Oh, okay, she said. Get well soon, John. Please. I love you. Yes. Me too, I said, closing the door. I heard her leave, then went to my computer where I did a search. When I found what I was looking for, I filled out the form then checked my email for confirmation. I noted the phone number and set a reminder on my cell phone to call the next day to confirm that everything would go as I asked. The next day, Thursday, was almost the same as Wednesday, except that Linda tried to lure me into bed in a sexy nightgown that hid absolutely nothing. I always liked looking at her and being with her, but now that I knew what she was doing with Grant behind my back, there was nothing that attracted me to her body. Sorry, Linda, but I feel a terrible migraine coming on, I said quietly. I'm going to take something and sleep here in the office tonight. A tear rolled down her cheek as she turned and walked away, but I didn't care. She called me at noon the next day to tell me she was leaving. I hope you feel better, John, she said. Maybe we can meet again when I get back on Monday. My parents will pick up the kids from school today and bring them home tomorrow afternoon for Sophie's party. Thank you for telling me about this. I said. I really love you, John, she said. I hope you believe me. Yes, I said. Bon voyage. See you later. Goodbye, Linda. I ended the call and dialed Lisa's number. I'm filling out all the paperwork now, John, she said. Tomorrow at 1730 they will be served at Grant's house. As you requested, Natalie will be filed on Monday. Thank you, Lisa, I said and ended the conversation. I told my personal assistant I was leaving for the day, locked my office, and headed home. I had a lot to do before the movers arrived in the afternoon. I had a whole bunch of boxes in the garage that I collected specifically for this job. I had just finished packing everything into boxes when the movers arrived with their truck at 5 p.m. They loaded everything into the back of the truck while I finished processing Linda's wedding dress. When I was finished, I placed the remains in a paper bag, folded the top of the bag, and attached an envelope to it. The envelope contained a short note, my wedding ring, and my marriage certificate, which I tore into four pieces. I handed the paper bag to one of the movers and asked that it be given to Linda when they arrived at Grant's house at 5.30 p.m. the next day. I also put in two $50 bills as tips for the two men. I will take care of this personally, Mr. Walker the young man said, accepting the package. Thank you, I said. I reheated the leftover roast and watched TV while I ate in the living room. That night I slept soundly in the master's bed. When Linda's parents arrived with their children, it was noon the next day. I had been on my feet for a long time and was preparing everything in the yard for Sophie's birthday celebration, which began around three o'clock in the afternoon. Linda ordered a cake, which I delivered in the morning, and put in the refrigerator. God, you've been so busy, Linda's mother, Rhonda, said as she entered. I really had no choice, I replied. I just hope everything goes well. I'm sure the kids will have a great time, she said. Did Sophie tell you that Linda won't be here? I asked. Yes, she said, Rhonda answered. I can't believe she won't even come to her daughter's birthday. She looked at me amusedly before continuing. Is everything okay between you? I sent the kids upstairs to get ready for the party before turning to Rhonda and her husband, George. No, it's not okay, 
I answered. I hate to tell you this, but you will soon find out anyway. I'm divorcing Linda. What? asked George. Why? I found out earlier this week that she's been sleeping with her boss for the last twelve years, I said. In fact, that's exactly what she's doing now. Oh my God, Rhonda said. Are you absolutely sure about this? Yes, completely. I had my suspicions for a long time, but I realized that something was wrong after she supposedly retired. About a month ago, I hired an investigator to look into this. I have his detailed report, photographs, and many videos if you are interested in seeing them, I said. No, everything is fine, she said. And you're sure you can't forgive her? I'm absolutely sure, I said. Not after all this time. I'd like to see this report, said George. I can't believe she could do such a stupid thing. While you're at it, I'll finish getting everything ready for Sophie's party, Rhonda said. I thanked Rhonda and asked George to follow me to my home office. I handed him my copy of the written report. His eyes widened as he read the details of his daughter's actions with Grant. When he finished reading, he shook his head. That stupid bitch, he said, reporting back. I'm sorry, John. I know that she is my daughter, but it is very difficult for me to cope with this. Now you know a little how I feel, I said. What are you going to do with that asshole Grant? He asked me. I filed a lawsuit against him and his sister for intentional infliction of mental suffering, I said. He snorted at this. And that's all? He asked. This man stole your wife, had sex with her for twelve years, and you're just going to sue him. Do you know how far this lawsuit will go? I understand, George, I said. I'd like to hit him in the genitals with a tire changer, but all that would do is land me in jail. I have two children to think about, George. I can't be a good parent if I end up in prison. George nodded his head. You're probably right, he said. However, according to that report, Grant seems to enjoy dating married women. I'll bet you a dollar that Linda isn't the first person he's done this to. Probably not, I said. I'll tell you what, John, said George. Why don't you let me deal with this bastard? He's not worth going to jail over. I said. Don't worry, son, he said. Nobody will go to jail. Although he was a brute, George was a large man. I met some of the guys he worked with, and they were pretty big too, and strong. And they all looked out for each other. What are you going to do? I asked. The less you know, the better, George said with a wink and a smile. Fine. Whatever you say, I told him. He smiled and patted me on the shoulder. Come on, John. Let's go have some fun with the kids, he said. We went outside and saw that Rhonda had finished packing everything for the party. When Sophie came downstairs, her eyes widened and she gasped when she saw the decorations. Thank you, Dad, she said, hugging me around the neck. It's so wonderful. I wish Mom was here to see it. Me too, I said. We can take photos for her to look at later, okay? Okay, she said. I started grilling hamburgers and hot dogs for everyone. At about 4.30 p.m., the doorbell rang, and I knew it was the beginning. Over the next half hour, more than a dozen parents showed up at the door with their children. They were all Sophie's school friends, and they all had a great time outside. One of the last to appear was Natalie and her husband, Ralph, with their daughter, Denise. I invited them inside and showed Denise the way to the backyard where the party was in full swing. I offered Natalie and Ralph something to drink, and they kindly agreed. I'm surprised to see you here, Natalie. I thought you guys had an important business trip this weekend, I said. It's Grant and Linda's job, she said. I'm just their assistant in the office. Yeah, I said. John, is everything okay? Natalie asked. Between you and Linda, that is. Why do you ask? I asked in response. You're not wearing a wedding ring, she said. I looked at my finger and saw a dent where the ring used to be. I gave it back to her. I said. Maybe Grant will have better luck than me. What does it mean? Natalie asked. Oh, please, Natalie, I said. Spare me this nonsense. I know your brother has been having sex with Linda for the last 12 years. I'll admit, you guys did a good job of pulling the wool over my eyes this whole time. John, please. Linda still loves you, Natalie said. Yes, so much so that she lied and deceived me for more than 10 years. I can't put into words how loved I feel right now. I said sarcastically. 
So what are you going to do? Natalie asked. What do you think? I'm divorcing this bitch. She and Grant will soon get what they deserve, I said, looking at my watch. Will they serve it? Natalie asked. Yes. Linda will be served with divorce papers, and I will sue Grant. They'll give it to you on Monday, I said. To me? Why are you suing me? I didn't do anything, Natalie objected. Exactly, I said. For more than ten years you knew what they were doing. In fact, my private investigator said you may even have contributed to this. And all this time, you acted like you were my friend. You could have said or done something. But you didn't. How often have you sat in my house, eaten my food at my table? How often have you taken advantage of my hospitality, knowing what Linda was doing to your brother? Did you enjoy making me a fool and a cuckold? Now my marriage and my family are destroyed, and you are partly to blame for this. Thanks to you three, I will never be able to love or trust another woman as long as I live, and my children lost their mother. I hope you're happy. John, I'm not happy at all, she said. I'm sorry. Regret is not an option, Natalie, I said. Twelve years, the three of you conspired to destroy my family. You didn't care what it did to me or my children. Now you have succeeded. It's not like that at all, said Natalie. Is it true? What? Was it just business between you three? Initially, yes, she said. Actually, it was Grant's idea. She wanted to get a job, so she accepted. But she didn't like it. Over time, everything changed. What after you sold your company and supposedly retired? I asked. It was all because of her, Natalie said. I thought it would all end. But Linda decided to continue the relationship. So she chose poorly, I said. But you still played your role. I'm really sorry, John, she said. None of us wanted to hurt you, but you did it, I said, in the most terrible way imaginable. I think it's best if you pack up your family and leave my house, Natalie. She nodded her head. I understand, John, she said quietly, before turning and walking away. And Natalie, I called. She turned to look at me. Never come back. She wiped a tear from her face, then went to get Denise and Ralph. Linda and Grant were lying naked in his bed when her phone buzzed, telling her that she had just received a text. Thinking it was John sending her photos from Sophie's party, she took the phone from the nightstand and read a message from Natalie. He knows everything. Oh, damn, she exclaimed. What's happened? Grant asked. It was Natalie. She said John knew everything, Linda said. I'd better clean myself up and go home. Are you sure this is reasonable? said Grant. Yes, Linda answered. She got out of bed and put on her robe. At that moment, they heard the doorbell ring. Who the hell could this be? Grant asked. He got out of bed and looked out the window. What the hell? he asked when he saw a sedan and a truck in his circular driveway. Throwing on trousers and a robe, he went downstairs, and Linda followed him. When he opened his door, he saw a man in a light jacket. What can I do for you? Grant asked. Are you Grant Jacobs? asked the man. Yes, Grant answered. Is Linda Walker here too? It's me, Linda said, coming out from behind Grant. I need to show documents, please, the man said. For what? Grant asked, taking out his wallet. The man said nothing as he looked at Grant's license. He then handed Grant an envelope. You have been served, said the man. Miss Walker, I need your ID, please. Of course, Linda said, taking her wallet out of her purse. The man looked at her license, then handed her an envelope. You have been served, he said. You should also know that there is a restraining order attached to the papers I just gave you. Both of you are required to remain at least 500 feet away from Mr. John Walker, his residence, his place of employment, and his two children. This includes their school. Failure to comply with this order may result in your arrest. All the best. As the man turned and walked away, Linda and Grant looked at each other in shock. Excuse me, is one of you Linda Walker? Asked another man, wearing jeans and a t-shirt. Yes, 
That is, Linda answered. The man handed her a paper bag with an envelope stapled to it, and she looked at him confused. I was asked to give this to you, ma'am. I have a few more boxes here, the man said. Where should I put them? Grant and Linda looked at each other before speaking. Uh, just put them in the front room for now, Grant said. Thank you, sir, the man said and returned to the truck. While the two lovers watched, the men brought several boxes and stacked them in the front room as Grant had indicated. While they were doing this, Linda opened the envelope. Inside was the man's wedding ring, a note, and their marriage certificate, torn into four pieces. Linda began to cry as she read the note. Linda, the note, written on a typewriter, began, The entire time we were married, all I did was love and support you. Imagine my surprise when I found out that for the last twelve years, you've been cheating on me with Grant Jacobs. So this is how you repaid my love for you, with lies and betrayal. All this time you said it was just business, but now I know that it was more, much more, than business. I hope it was all worth it. I advise you to contact a lawyer at the first opportunity. The earlier the better. I've already divided our finances, according to the divorce papers, and I've already changed the locks on the doors. Since I have been the children's primary caregiver since you began your relationship with Grant 12 years ago, I am asking for full custody. However, I will not refuse you dates. Please have your lawyer contact mine to arrange this. Also, since Grant allowed you to stay with him, I sent all your things to his house. If you want to take anything else from the house, ask your lawyer to contact me and we can make arrangements for you to take back everything that you consider to be yours. I have no desire to see your face or hear your lies anymore. Please don't mess with the kids or me. I promise that if you try to contact me, the restraining order will be enforced. Please don't fight the terms of the divorce. I don't want this to get any uglier than it needs to be for the sake of the kids, but if you decide to challenge it, I will. For your information, I have photographs, several videos, and a detailed report from a private investigator who has been looking into your activities for the past month. I have not yet told the children about the reason for the divorce, but I will when I feel that the time has come. Your parents read the report, but they haven't seen any photos or videos yet. For once in your life, do the right thing and end this sham marriage. From now on, Linda, you are dead to me. Goodbye. The note was signed. John. With tears in her eyes, she opened the paper bag and saw the ashes that had once been a wedding dress, the same dress she had worn when she married John. She fell to the floor and sobbed. Grant took her in his arms and read the letter. What a son of a bitch, he said. I'll kick his ass for this. No, Grant, please don't. I don't want to see you in jail. It's all on me, she said. What did you get? He sued me for intentional infliction of emotional distress, Grant said. He asks for $5 million. I'll call my lawyer and see what I can do about all this. I wonder if he's going to go after Natalie, too, Linda said. Let's find out, Grant said, picking up the phone. If yes, then we need to meet and discuss it. Let's see if we can mitigate the damage. When the party ended, I thanked everyone for coming and thanked everyone for the gifts. I turned around and saw the mess in the house and knew I would be busy for a while. Sophie came up to me, with tears in her eyes. What's the matter, honey? I asked, taking her in my arms. I wish Mom was here, she said. I missed her. Yes, me too, I said. Unfortunately, your mother had other things to do. Sophie looked at me sadly. Are you divorcing her? she asked, and tears rolled down her face. I didn't want to ruin her day, but I knew that someday I would have to tell her about it. We'll talk about this later, okay? It's that guy Grant, isn't it? Aaron came up and asked. Why do you ask that? I asked him. I heard my mother talk to him on the phone several times, he said. Interesting, I thought. I decided not to pursue this topic, at least for now. We'll talk tomorrow, I said firmly. Today is Sophie's birthday. Now I need you to help me clean up here, okay? Okay, Dad, Aaron said. I hugged Sophie again and kissed her on the cheek. Everything will be fine, I told her, wiping a tear from her face. I love you. I love you too, Daddy, she said. 
Rhonda and George stayed and helped us clean the house. Are you going to be okay, John? Rhonda asked before they left. I'll be fine, I said. Thank you for coming and helping. You're welcome, she said. If you need anything, anything at all, don't be shy. Ask. I appreciate it, I told her. Rhonda hugged me and George shook my hand. Take care of yourself, son, he said. I closed and locked the door after they left. Exhausted, I went upstairs and fell asleep almost as soon as my head hit the pillow. The next day, after preparing breakfast for the three of us, I got up and went about my usual Sunday routine. I mowed the lawn and Aaron trimmed the bushes with a grinder. When we were done, we cleaned everything up and put it back in its place. It was lunchtime, so I went inside and took a shower and was a little surprised to see Sophie making sandwiches for us. We ate at the table, then cleared the plates. Sophie looked at me when we finished. Okay, Dad, she said. You have to tell us what's going on. I was afraid of this, but I knew it was going to happen, so I brought the children into the living room and asked them to sit down. There's no easy way to say this, so I'll just say it, I said. I'm divorcing your mother. The children took my statement calmly, without outbursts of anger. I thought they would be upset, but they didn't seem to mind. She cheated on you with that guy Grant, didn't she? Aaron asked. Yes, I said quietly, nodding my head. I thought so, Aaron said. I bet this has been going on for a long time, hasn't it? Why do you ask that? I asked. It was just the way she talked to him, he said. I heard her talking to him on the phone. She talks to him the same way she talks to you, Dad. I nodded my head. Why didn't I think of this myself? I already knew the reason. Until recently, I always trusted her and respected her privacy. I didn't feel the need to eavesdrop when she was on the phone with Grant or anyone else. So how long has this been going on, Dad? Asked Sophie. As far as I can tell, 12 years old, honey, I replied. She sighed. That means she started shortly after I was born, she said. Quite, I said. Damn her, said Sophie. Sorry, Dad, she quickly added. I understood her feelings, so this time I left everything as it was. Can I stay with you? She asked. Of course you can, if that's what you want, I said. Me too, Dad, Aaron said. You were always here with us. Thanks, guys. This means more to me than you know. The thing is... I asked for custody of you guys, I said. I extended my arms, and they both came towards me, wrapping their arms around me. We hugged, and I was overcome with joy that my children wanted to stay with me. After a tearful hug, we spent the rest of the day without incident, but there was sadness in the house. The next few days also passed without incident. George and Rhonda agreed to pick up the kids after school and stayed with me until I got home from work. I didn't want to impose myself on them like that, but they understood everything and happily agreed to help. Rhonda even cooked us dinner that night, which was very helpful. On Tuesday, my lawyer Lisa called me. Linda consulted with a lawyer and wanted to visit the children. I didn't want to see her in the house and I was afraid that she might do something stupid, like leave with them. What about a restraining order? I asked. If you agree, then we can postpone it for a while. Say from 9 to 1 p.m. Friday evening to 9 a.m. Sunday, Lisa said. I know it will be difficult, but the last thing you want to do is seem unreasonable. I understand. What if she comes to the children, to her parents, on Saturday? I suggested. I can let the kids stay there on Friday after school and pick them up on Saturday evening or Sunday. I'll suggest it and see what her lawyer says, Lisa said. Under no circumstances should Grant or Natalie be there with her, I added, and there's a chance that the children won't want to see her. They're not too happy with her right now. I'll pass this on, said Lisa. Is there anything else? I asked. Yes, her lawyer wants to see the full private investigator's report, Lisa said. I made a copy and sent it. She should receive it no later than Thursday. So she hired a lawyer, I asked. Yes, she hired Beth Sawyer on Monday, Lisa said. I'm surprised Beth took this case because she hates scammers about as much as I do. I suspect it's because she works at the same firm as Grant's lawyer. Either way, I'll talk to Beth and see what happens. I will be in touch. I received a response from Lisa the next day. 
Linda and her lawyer agreed to my proposals, provided that I delayed the restraining order for 36 hours, from midnight Saturday to noon Sunday. And this will only affect Linda, not Grant or Natalie. They also agreed that Linda would visit the children at her parents' house and not take them anywhere. If the children perceive the situation normally, Linda will stay with them overnight. I accepted these terms, not wanting to appear unreasonable to the court. At first, the children were not very happy, but I managed to persuade them to try it. George and Rhonda agreed to pick them up after school on Friday. They were supposed to bring them back to the house on Sunday afternoon, after the visit. I had my doubts, but I trusted George and Rhonda. George even offered to take me to a bar to watch sports over a few beers on Saturday night. On Friday morning, I made sure the kids had everything they needed for the weekend. We hugged and kissed before I drove them to school, and I reminded them to call me if Grant or Natalie showed up, or if their mother tried to take them somewhere. I left for work after making sure they were safe inside the building. The next evening, at about 5.30 p.m., George picked me up at home and we went to the Flatstick Pub, a popular sports bar downtown. We ordered a burger and a beer and watched the events on large monitors located along the entire wall. George brought me up to speed between snacks. Linda came today around 90 a.m., he said. It was a little tense at first, but then everything calmed down a little. The kids weren't happy with her, and they made it clear to her, but she confessed. This surprised me. This surprises me too, I said. She says she still loves you. I have a feeling she's going to try to reconcile, George said. Are you ready to consider this? I'm afraid not, George, I said. After 12 years of lies and deception, no. I can understand that. Did you really burn her wedding dress? It cost me over $2,000 when you got married, George said. It seemed right at the time, I said. She told us that her lawyer looked at the private investigator's report and read her the riot act. George said. I think she's starting to see things from your point of view. Too little, too late, I said. George nodded his head and took a sip of his beer. We heard a noise behind me, and as I turned around, I felt something hit my head, and I saw stars. I fell to the floor and saw a foot approaching my head. I was stunned, but I managed to avoid being hit. I'll fucking kill you, you son of a bitch, I heard Grant shout. I looked up and saw him standing over me and decided it was now or never, remembering the techniques my father had taught me years ago. I raised my leg and kicked Grant in the groin as hard as I could. He screamed and fell back, hitting his head on the corner of the table next to us. He fell to the floor and I got on top of him as quickly as possible. I kneed him in the groin a few more times, then started hitting him in the face with my fists, right, left, then right again. Swing. Hit. Repeat. There was no technique or fancy martial arts moves involved. It was blind, seething rage, and the desire to kill the asshole who destroyed my marriage and happy family. Grant didn't move while I hit him in the face, and it didn't dawn on me that he was already unconscious. I felt two pairs of hands trying to lift me off of Grant, and I realized that they belonged to George and another man. I remember howling something before I lost consciousness. Although it seemed like an eternity had passed, in fact, as I learned later, the contraction lasted less than a minute. I woke up in a hospital bed and saw a doctor examining me, shining a light in my eyes. My right arm was bandaged, and my left arm and forearm were in a cast. There was also an IV in my arm. My head hurt so bad it was throbbing. I think he'll be fine the doctor said. He'll have a bad headache for a while, but I don't see any signs of a concussion. We'll give him something to ease the pain and let him rest for a while before we send him home. Thank you, doctor, I heard George say. Confused, I looked at him. He smiled, looking at me. Do you hear, son? You will live. I know you're hurting, but you need to see the other guy. I heard that he has problems with his reproductive organs. He lost several teeth and almost lost an eyeball. Looks like you broke a knuckle in his jaw. I take it it was Grant? Yes, I grimaced. How long have I been here? Night. It's 8.30 Sunday morning, George said. 
By the way, there are a couple of very big policemen there who want to talk to you. Are you ready? Yes, this needs to end, I said. George waved to the officers and they entered the room. Mr. Walker, I'm Sergeant Smith and this is Officer Jones. We're the ones who responded to your argument at the Flatstick pub last night. How are you feeling this morning, sir? He asked. It's like I've been hit on the head, I told him. Smith smiled and turned to his notes. What can you tell us about last night? He asked. Not very much, I said. I was eating a hamburger and beer with my father-in-law, and the next thing I knew, I got hit in the head. The guy threatened to kill me, so I defended myself. Smith nodded his head. That's almost exactly what the witnesses said, Smith said, looking at his notes. And surveillance video confirms this. Do you know the person who attacked you? Yes, Sergeant. His name is Grant Jacobs. I sued him and he's in my divorce, I said. Divorce? asked the sergeant. Yes, I said. Okay, he said, writing in his notebook. I assume you want to press charges. Yes, I want to, I told him. We also have a restraining order against him. Okay, he said. We'll check it out. We'll leave it at that, Mr. Walker. Someone might want to talk to you later, so I'll ask you to stay in town for a while. No problem, Sergeant, I said, raising my hands. He smiled, nodding his head. Then they left my room. After they left, Rhonda, Linda, and the children came into the room. What is she doing here? I asked, looking at Linda. My restraining order doesn't go into effect until noon, Linda said. I thought you would be with your boyfriend, I said. She looked at the floor in embarrassment. I wanted to see you first, she said. Besides, Natalie is with him, and he is still in the process of treatment. I nodded my head, and the children approached me from both sides. Sophie had tears in her eyes. Are you going to be okay, Dad? She asked. I'll be fine, honey, I said. I heard you kicked Grant's ass last night, Aaron said with a smile. I heard that too, I said, looking at George but there's nothing to be proud of here. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I hear you, Dad, Aaron said. Are you going to be okay, John? Linda asked. Yes, he will be fine, Sophie told her mother. We'll take care of him, right, Aaron? Yes, we will take care, said my son. Linda looked at our two teenage children before speaking. If you guys don't mind, I'd like to talk to your father for a few minutes. Alone, she said. They looked at her for a moment and then nodded their heads. Okay, Sophie said, but we'll be right outside the door. Come on, Aaron, she added, extending her hand to her brother. They left the room, followed by George and Rhonda. John, Linda began after they left, I can't tell you how much I regret everything. Well, as I told Natalie last Saturday, sorry isn't everything, I said. You lied and cheated on me for 12 years, and you think sorry is supposed to make it all go away or something? Have I really been such a bad husband for you? All I ever did was love you and support you. I don't understand. You were, are, the best husband and father a woman could wish for, she said sadly. But even that wasn't good enough for you, was it? That's not true at all, she said. Is it true? To me, that's what it looks like, I said. You don't understand, she said. Then try to explain it to me, I said. At first, it was just a way to get a job, she said. Grant said that sex with me was one of the conditions for getting this position. This is sexual harassment, I said. This is illegal. Why didn't you come to me first? We could do something about it. Oh, I get it. You really wanted this job. So much so that you thought sex with Grant was a small price to pay even if it destroys our family. Basically, I made a deal with the devil, she said. And now you're going to blame the devil? I asked. Give me a break. The truth is that you wanted this job so badly that you were willing to fuck him for it, even if it costs you everything. What were you saying there? Is it just business? Tell me, Linda, how does the destruction of our family fit into your profit and loss chart? Eh? I would like to know why you continued to do this after you supposedly retired. It was on my conscience, she said. 
I guess I got to the point where I decided I could have my cake and eat it too. You have feelings for him, don't you? That's why you kept doing it. How long did you plan to continue? For the rest of your life? Did you really think that I would never, ever know? Or did you think that when I found out, I would just walk away and let you continue? And remember, I know a lot more than you think, I said. Yes, I have feelings for him, she said. It was hard not to, after all these years. I thought you loved me enough to let me do this. I tried my best not to let it take anything away from you. Are you kidding? I asked incredulously. Every second you spent in bed with him was a second taken from us. Of course, you remember the definition of the term opportunity cost, loss of potential benefits from other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. You chose him over your family. As a result, you lost your family. But I still love you, she said. I never stopped loving you. But you have lost respect for me, I said. She looked at me, shocked. No, never, she said. Yes, I lost it, I said. That's why you told him that you would have sex with him for the rest of your life and said that if you divorce, you will threaten to rape me. Her eyes widened. Did you hear that? She asked. Yes, and even more, I said. For example, you told Grant that you would rather spend time with him than with your own daughter on her birthday. What kind of mother does this? What kind of signal do you think this sends to an impressionable teenager? Have you even thought about her? Or Aaron when you missed his birthday last year? She recoiled. I guess I'm just a lousy wife and mother, she said quietly. Your words, not mine. But if the shoes fit, I said with a shrug. By the way, I'm sure your lover's friend will breathe a sigh of relief when he learns that I can't sue him for alimony. Yes, I took a DNA test and the children are mine. She looked at me, shocked. Oh my God, did you really think I would do this to you? She asked. Well, you lied to me for 12 years, I said. You've been plotting and deceiving me all this time and hiding your affair from me. What would you think? You might find it easier to hear that I didn't learn anything from you too. You may not know this, but Grant loves to play on the field. You're not the only one he sleeps with. I suspected, but didn't know for sure. What do you want me to do now? She asked. Sign the papers, Linda. Put an end to this sham marriage. Then seek help and get yourself in order. For the sake of the children, I said. I suspect you will have plenty of time. I think Grant will probably be a guest of the state for some time. Perhaps you are right, she said. Okay, I'll sign the papers. Forgive me, John, for all. You said that, I told her. Probably yes, isn't it? Thank you for letting me be with the kids this weekend, she said. You're welcome, I said. I know you don't believe me, but I love you, she said. And I would like you to find in your heart a way to make sure that we stay together. You're right. I do not believe you. But thanks for telling me anyway, I said. Probably some part of me will always continue to love you. But this is not enough. I need to be able to trust my partner. And after what you did, I don't know if I can trust anyone again. She nodded her head, and tears rolled down her cheeks. I understand, she said quietly. Goodbye, John. She leaned over and kissed me on the cheek. Goodbye, Linda, I said. She turned and left the room in tears. George, Rhonda, and the children came in after she left. Is everything okay, son? asked George. Yes, I answered. We talked a little. I think she finally realized how badly she screwed up. Does this mean that you and your mother will be together again? asked Sophie. I shook my head. No, honey, I said. But you guys love each other, she said. For a marriage to be strong, Sophie, it takes a lot more than love, I said. You also need trust, and now I don't trust her. Someday, you yourself will understand this. The doctor came, did a final examination, and released me. George took me home with the kids. Later that evening, I received a frantic call from George and Rhonda. Natalie called them and told them that Linda tried to commit suicide by overdosing on sleeping pills and alcohol. They said Natalie found her when she went to Grant's house to pick up some of his belongings. 
The note on her nightstand read, I'm sorry. She almost died from an overdose but survived and spent several days in the hospital. After being evaluated by mental health professionals, she was released into the custody of George and Rhonda and eventually moved in with them. She signed the divorce papers without contesting anything. Lisa told me that in 90 days I would become a free man. Free... Yes, exactly. Grant and Natalie's lawyer quickly negotiated with us for half of what I asked for. I ended up with about $3.5 million left after Lisa subtracted it. I put a million in accounts for both kids to put them through college until they graduated and put the rest in the bank. I started planning to go on a Mediterranean cruise with them during their next summer vacation. Grant was found guilty of aggravated assault and attempted murder based on video footage taken during the attack. He was sentenced to 10 years in state prison, but will be eligible for parole in about 8.5 years. I saw Linda whenever I took the kids to George and Rhonda's house. Sometimes we sat and talked about different things, but I could never forget what she did. She went to a psychologist who helped her understand why she acted the way she did, but she continued to indulge herself in the fantasy that I would bring her back. I was glad she was getting help, but it was like closing the barn door after the horses had escaped. Over the next few months, she gradually restored her relationship with the children, which I was also happy about. George told me that she spends most of her time writing articles for various business blogs and giving up dating. She was upset to learn that I was taking the kids on a Mediterranean cruise without her, but she dealt with it by wishing us well. The kids often sent her text messages with pictures of places we visited. I met a wonderful woman from British Columbia, Nikki, who, like me, was going on a cruise after her divorce. She was about a year younger than Linda, had shoulder-length blonde hair, was quite pretty and had a bubbly personality. I especially liked how she ended many of her sentences with, huh. She also had two children, a year or so younger than mine, who spent the summer with their grandparents in northern Idaho. We spent quite a lot of time together discussing our situations and shared a bed several times. More than once I heard Sophie teasing me. Daddy has a girlfriend, she hummed, nudging me with her elbow. We exchanged contact information when the cruise ended and promised to stay in touch via email and Skype. I'm not sure if anything will come of this, but we communicate with each other on the internet at least twice a week. We adjusted to life without Linda in the house. My boss was more than happy to work with me so I could drop the kids off and pick them up at school. I knew that the time would come when Aaron was old enough to drive and he would take on this responsibility. George came into the house shortly after we returned from the cruise and told us some bad news. They're going to put Linda in a mental hospital for a while, he said. About? Why? I asked. Sophie sent her a photo of the three of you having dinner with that Canadian girl you met on the cruise, he said. I don't think she meant it in a bad way, but Linda didn't take it very well. She lost control. Rhonda and I found her in the bathroom. She cut her wrists. Oh, God, I said. I'm sorry to hear it. I was really sorry to hear that she tried to kill herself again, but part of me felt a little justified. Now she knew at least a little how I felt when I first found out about her and Grant. Yes, me too. Luckily, she messed it up and managed to survive. But doctors said that with her history, she needed constant care and monitoring, George said. Rhonda and I are too old to watch her 24 hours a day. Therefore, they decided to admit her to the hospital. For how long? I asked. It's hard to say, son, he said. Maybe for several years. Maybe forever. I just do not know. Let me know if we can do anything, I said. Thank you, son. I appreciate it, he said. Nikki and I continued our long-distance relationship, and I found that the more we talked, the closer I felt to her. I also found myself fantasizing about her. A lot. She was sad to hear about Linda, mainly because of the impact it had on George, Rhonda, and the children, but she shared my feelings. The last time we spoke, she mentioned that she was coming to visit us with her children. She also invited me to take the kids to her home, a two-story log house on 50 wooded acres north of Kamloops that she said was built in the late 1800s. I've never been north of the U.S. border before, so this was interesting. 
Who knows what will happen if anything happens at all? Anyway, I'll save that for another story. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.